cunts. Don't forget to click the subscribe button. Well, he was talking. I was looking up at the, the wall of some of the kids. Klaus Kleinfeld, who is Mr. World now. Biggest deal in history, right? He, I mean, uh, he wasn't the man he is today. And that was from 1997. So 22 years, I mean, he just wasn't. Uh, not even a reasonable facsimile. His favorite uh, part of the sentence, and, and Klaus, if some of your people hear this, this, this tough shit, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was either for yes, no, or maybe. The same, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that just was it. And of course, now he's at the United Nations, and this, and he's with the Premier of China, blah, 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 blah. But uh, so to see these guys, um, Rick Scott wasn't as smooth as he is now. Uh, uh, the because uh, I've known him 35 years, but th these guys, the names I've just uh, used, got and it resonated with them as being all they can be. That's the thing that they have in common, and we're just fortunate that he's here uh, uh, to uh, share with you. The um, it's it's I didn't have an iPhone or uh, when I first met you. I, I wish I had some of those. Uh, uh, conversations that we first had many years ago. But now he's got, you know, uh, millions and millions and millions of people that view him. And uh, m more importantly than just view him, they do with a lot of what he says. Okay? So when he says influencer, you know, leadership is getting them to do what he wants them to do when he wants them to do it. Not when they pull their thumb out of their ass and decide to do it. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, it's made him, uh, you know, a guy like on the Varney show and the Fox News. Uh, the uh, Fox News is afraid I'll say fuck or something, you know, so it's not likely I'm going to get interviewed there. But uh, it's, uh, he's done great. Any, uh, any questions or comments about Dan? Uh, yes, sir. One more question. As a, you have a sales slash marketing company. How do you address your own internal operations? In, in what way? Do you have someone else come in who's an expert in operations? Well, I own? have my COO, the COO which okay. to, to run it. Uh, I have my upper CFO also to run a lot of this stuff. Uh, but a lot of big, bigger picture strategies. Uh, can I give them a framework just to, sure. to help them out? Yeah. Can I draw? Yeah, sure. Out? Absolutely. Here. It's, it's easier to write my draw. Thank you. Can you guys see? Right. So, I'll do that. I think there are like five levels of what I call strategic thinking. Five levels. Okay. The first level is what I call like gimmicks. I'll give you an example. So, let's say I want to sell a CD. You guys know what CD is? So yeah, CD. Mm -hmm. Not MP3, the CD. So you want to, I want to sell a CD, and I want to use you know yellow packaging to put on a shelf to get more attention. It's a gimmick, right? That's a gimmick. So that's the first level. Which a lot of you think of all our business owner entrepreneurs when they want to increase sales, they focus on gimmicks. Like what tricks? Can I do a buy two get one free? Can I can I do a discount? Can I do whatever? Right? That's a gimmick. Next level is what I call tactics. So tactics is where now I'm selling a CD, but I am going to sell the CD, but I'm going to include, like maybe this is limited edition, right? Or there's certain songs, or I'm gonna include a little, little like uh, a photo from the star, from the singer or something like that. It's, it's more a tactic thing, right? Tactics. And then you have strategies, which goes back to seed example, high level, strategic thinking. Strategies is I want to sell a CD, but now I'm thinking not just, yeah, I can, you know, put in a nicer shelf space and maybe nicer packaging, but maybe I could do a special event where I have the actual singer come to the store to do autograph. That's a strategy. I'm not selling one, I'm not selling, how can I sell 1,000 of these one night? That's a strategy. Go ahead levels. And then you have uh, what I call business model. Okay. 
selling the CD. Uh, you know what? That's nice, but maybe we can put the put the stuff on like on digital. We digitize the song so people can download it. Maybe that's better. That's that's not. I'm not selling the the thing that was selling before. I'm taking the same thing, but I'm thinking how can I transition and change the whole different different business model. It's a different revenue stream, right? It's it's something outside of my business. And then you have what I call game changer. This, this is iTunes. This is iTunes. So instead of doing that, why don't I create a platform so that all everybody else sell their songs on my platform and get a piece of that? Uh, my job with my team, I focus on these two. My executive, they focus on these. Like probably most strategies on tactics, and the rest of the team members, they mix tactics. But my, my time spends on thinking about this where that's not what they think about, if that makes sense. So I look at what I do, and I say, hey, this is what I focus on. So I would come up with business model, something that's completely different outside of what whatever we're doing right now. That's why I'm here, right? Where when we go back, launch a, an acquisition division, that's not what my team is thinking. They, they don't know I'm gonna do that, but I'm gonna do that. Then I might acquire companies in a totally different industry. They're like, what the fuck? This, right? Because I want to diversify. Maybe in an industry that I can leverage my brand. So you may imagine I buy a company for $10 million. If I can put my personal brand on it, I can I can double, triple the revenue in a very short period of time. I can get all my money, money back within, within months, refinance, because of my brand. So look, leverage my social capital, leverage the team that I have. Right? So it's like QLA, but my version steroids, right? On a different thing. And I could raise capital easier because of the brand. And also because of the brand. So that helps, right? So as that grows, and then it, it helps with everything else, right? Then I post on social media. Hey, look, I just did this and did this. And now that creates more attention in the marketplace. So it becomes a thing, right? Is that, is that helpful? Is that helpful? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. You're going to teach me uh, uh, turn the meatheads into game changers, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, yeah, I, that's I, your I job. Say, I don't I'll, want your no job. I'll man. reserve my judgment on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other comments or questions for me or whatever? It's, uh, it's very similar, though, to what you teach. Because as the oh, number yeah. one person, your job is about to find the money. And find the deals. Yes. And let everyone else deal with. And I call it OPM and other people and other people's money and the uh, social capital and you know the the only real currency uh, in the 21st century uh, are people. You know, Oprah says it uh, simplistically 35 years ago. It's not it's not so important that the direction of your bus. It's who gets on the bus. It's who gets on the bus, and uh, the and she's been involved in a lot of things, not all of which are successful, but I mean, um, and uh, but when you have a, a a name brand like Dan does, and like Oprah, okay, uh, to name two, I mean, uh, and I'm not a social responsibility kind of guy. I'm not. We all know that, right? I hope the world ends the day after I die, okay? <laughs> Taking my grandchildren, everybody. Well, I don't give a fuck, but but uh, the. Uh, when you have a brand, uh, you have a social responsibility. And uh, the, some people take it seriously and some people don't take it so seriously. And I've only gotten the social responsibility game, if you will, since I turned 60 uh, the last 14 years. But you do. And <clears throat> when people listen to you, rightly or wrongly, you have a responsibility uh, uh, not to put out shit. And that's why I, I've got a, you know, I've got a, a, uh, a feather up my ass about most of the self-help personal development industry because they're putting out shit. I showed you the big piles of dinosaur shit. Most of what they put out is crap. And uh, the, the, in my judgment, the thing that pisses me off the most is they know it's crap. It's not, if they didn't know, you know, some of the things our parents told us, they actually believed. It was shit, but, they, you know, they believed, Okay. But it's like uh, the, the, the self-help guys and gals know uh, uh, that uh, most of what they put out is bullshit. Now, Dan's actually made money doing this. Uh, most of the guys that are doing this affiliate program and uh, the uh, online marketing haven't made a fucking dime or made a de minimis amount of money. 
um, and the um, but um, anything else uh, for for Dan? Any other comments, questions? We want to thank him a lot. And 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 and, and he uh, uh, he hasn't been an embarrassment to me. He's continued to make me proud. I wish I could say that about all my mentees, but I can't because uh, we've had uh, a few of the guys, uh, not the gals. You know, and that's another thing, it's, it's strange, but a few of the guys have uh, stepped on their dick uh, publicly, and uh, uh, yeah, I trained them, yeah, I did, you know, with my head down. But, um, okay, now, um, we're um, with the, uh, we've taken you down to uh, uh, the, the motivated seller. Uh, ideally, the accountants and the lawyers are as with, um, Jason, we have a real live example now uh, here, uh, and it just, uh, you know, fortuitously, he happens to be in the seminar. Uh, but I mean, we've got many, many, many of these guys and gals out there doing this. Uh, and, the, and, and the fact, uh, in an area that supposedly it's, was not supposed to be easy in Australia, and it was not supposed to be easy on where he comes from, Australia, um, but all that's horseshit. The system works whether you're in Vancouver or you're in Adelaide, Australia. It just does. And uh, because there are motivated sellers worldwide, it's our job, like prospecting, to find those motivated sellers. And it's, it's really not as hard as you would think because when they have no succession plan, when they have no exit strategy other than falling dead in their business, it's up to us to explain to them. Some of you will do it nicer than Jason, and I. Jason does it nicer than me. That you know, this is the last fucking chance you may have, um, and it is. But once you're out and you've got four or five or six or ten months under your belt of momentum of talking to a lot of people, the people start coming back. It's like when Frank said, uh, "They say call me in, in a year." He calls them in a month, but uh, they start calling them back in two or three months. And uh, so you, you want that uh, momentum. Now, now let's take a, a real live example. Um, the, um, in, in a little bit, we're going to start, we're going to talk about goals and affirmations that are the bedrock of uh, the program. They're uh, one of the, uh, on a three-legged stool, they're at least one of the legs of the stool. But <clears throat> when they... Um, you're in the due diligence phase. And now most of the deals that you're going to look at for the one to two million, your own board can do the due diligence. They can. They may not want to because they don't want the responsibility of if they fuck it up. But clearly, they can do the due diligence. Three million up, you're going to want your professionals, uh, outside professionals to do the due diligence. Um, the... Um, and as I told you, uh, due diligence is a euphemism for knocking the price down. And only one time in 50 years have I ever seen the price go up. And I explained to you the reason why the price went up then. But when the, um, my recommendation is you participate in the due diligence with your professionals the first couple of times. So you know which rocks to turn over. Um, the, uh, and, uh, and, and, and just so you understand, by audit, when a, a big four audit team comes in, they do not examine every single piece of paper. They examine every fifth piece of paper, or every third piece of paper, or every sixth piece of paper, because they're looking for fact patterns. Fact patterns. They're not looking for definitive, you know, there's not a red flag that comes up and says, I stole here. You know, but they're looking for, it doesn't, there's no rhyme or reason where how the money got changed, where the money went. And now with electronic banking, it's harder to f trace fraud. It's harder to chase malfeasance. And of course, electronic banking, we all want, well, I, I don't bank, but I mean, you all want it because it's, uh, because it's easy. They tell me electronic banking is easy, okay? Um, 
And the, 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 the challenge is that you want to understand, even though you're not a financial person, for those of you that aren't, you want to roughly understand, after the first two or three acquisitions, the flow of information and the fact patterns. So when a big acquisition comes and they are trying to explain to you why it's not going to happen or what they found, you've got a rough idea. Like, I'm not an oil and gas guy. I didn't know anything about oil and gas when I was in the business, but now... I've looked at so many oil and gas deals. I've done due diligence on so many oil and gas deals that I know, you know, and forevermore, I know the right questions to ask. And the reason why I want you to uh, be part of that due diligence in the pre-sales stage, you'll have better questions to ask the seller because you'll know where the possible red flags or amber flags or yellow flags are. And you can preclude going through a deal that you get two thirds through and it falls to shit because due diligence brought up these red flags that you could have shortcutted it by asking the right questions of the seller. It's not dissimilar to when you're asking your board members, is there anything in your background that would preclude us finalizing the sale? And this is in the templates again. It's not dissimilar and you have questions to ask the seller. I told you day before yesterday, you have three due diligence uh, databases. And, uh, the, um, and you don't need to know these cold or anything, but somebody's got to answer all those questions. Somebody. Not necessarily you, but somebody. Even on small deals. I mean, it, it, it's pretty obvious that uh, Chris, who the lady ripped him for $18,000 before the close, should have been caught. Should have been caught. It wasn't. And you saw he's as happy as Larry that the deal closed. Well, you know, Kind of Forrest Gump happy, if you noticed. And that's why you all have a chance. Because you're closer to Forrest Gump than Einstein. Everybody in this room. Now, see, you don't think that's so funny, do you? But you are closer to Forrest. You're closer to 80 than 180. IQ. I just hope not too close to 80 as opposed to the 180. Now, uh, I've been on record. I've told, said this before. I, I only have 140 IQ. I'm not, uh, I, I'm not uh, Einstein, but I'm a, a far way away from Forrest. But, okay, so now you, you, you're in the due diligence process, and you're going to get that sheet of paper that I passed out yesterday. That is about the fourth or fifth stage of due diligence by a big accounting firm that says what's still missing. But when you look down that list, that's a lot of stuff. And that when I tell you somebody's got to be crossing the T's and dotting the I's, I mean, somebody's got to be detail-oriented. Now, some of your personalities are detail-oriented. I don't suffer from that. You notice I say suffer from it. I'm, that's not me. I'm just not a detail-oriented guy. Although I have a memory that I remember details, but I, I don't follow up on the details. So you, you, want, you want to be able to feel, not comfortable, but you want to be able to feel that somebody on the board level, normally your CFO, uh, your accountant, and one of the industry experts is uh, looking to make sure the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Now, in some cases, you're going to get uh, all the board members are going to be interested. Because uh, some deals are fun deals and some deals aren't fun deals. I mean, uh, they, they've got extra bells and whistles and the board members, you know, I haven't seen that in 25 years and, and they'll, they'll dig into it. Most of the acquisitions aren't going to be like that. Most of the acquisitions are going to be cut and dry, meat and potatoes, vanilla ice cream and boring. And boring. And that's why it's so hard to stay the course. Now, let's just project 25 acquisitions from now. You're on number 26. It's a motherfucker to stay focused. Just a minute, Cap. It's a motherfucker to stay focused. You've done it 25 times. And that's when you make mistakes. That's when you get, you get sloppy and you make mistakes. And it's like I bought a um, mobile home park on a toxic waste dump. Me, of all people. A toxic fucking waste dump that was producing two-headed catfish. And yet I still couldn't get the Canadians to move out. It was mostly snowbirds, 80% 80, 80, 80 snowbirds. The Canadians came from Canada down to Florida. 
And I remember we had a big town meeting, and uh, they said, well, none of the kids have got two heads. <laughs> yeah, I know, sir. I, I know none of the kids have two heads. But I, and I'm holding up a catfish like this. Well, you know, they didn't give a shit. And, of course, uh, I think it was uh, KPMG, uh, and we had hired two environmental firms uh, and our lawyers. So all four big firms uh, missed it. And why do I like KPMG or the big firms and the big law firms, um, knowing I'm going to pay 30 to 50 to 70% more premium? Because when they fuck something up, they've got deep pockets to sue, and they've got big malpractice insurance policies. And your little Joe Schwartz and company from uh, Tallahassee, who probably doesn't even have any insurance. That's the premium and that's the luxury of having a big firm. And you may never have to use that, that they've got deep pockets. But the one time that you don't use them and you get sued for malpractice, malfeasance and, and or fraud, you wish to hell you had one of those big firms you could fall back on. So we had, uh, we're on a toxic waste dump by 90 yards. 90 yards on a toxic waste dump. But nine, uh, didn't matter, one inch, 90 yards, we still had two-headed catfish. And the, and the Canadians, God love them, nobody even su threatened to sue us or anything. I, I still don't believe it, but I saw it with my own eyeballs. The Canadians are just easy going, I guess, you know. They're swimming, and they're out there uh, water skiing and swimming with a catfish like nothing happened. But they've never had a bank fail in the history of the banking. So God, God love them. They can keep the cat two-headed catfish, and they haven't had any bank failures. And maybe they come together. I don't know. I don't know. So the, you, you, you're going to get about um, three, two to three weeks before the deal actually closes. You're going to get a, some, a letter or an indication from the financial institution, uh, and you're continuing to check your CFO is continuing to check with the bank. How are things going? Is there anything else? How are things going? Is there anything? I mean, just repeat, repeat, repeat. And then finally, they're going to say uh, it's going to come up uh, the final credit committee and uh, it, it should be uh, funded uh, in 10 days. And you stay on them, you stay on them, stay on them until it is funded. And uh, then you want the money transferred as quickly as humanly possible. Because contrary to what you think, a cashier's check or a banker's draft, which are supposed to be golden. In other words, once you issue a cashier's check, once you issue a banker's draft, they can't be rescinded, is wrong. They can be. I've had banker's draft and cashier's checks frozen in foreign bank accounts. And when I was growing up, cashier's check, banker's draft were like cash. That is not true. All they have to do now is say, money laundering. You some, say something? Or you're just flipping your pen. Well, with, with the um, DD part? Yep. It's happening twice now. KPG don't want to do the commercial easy bit. It's happy to do the financial. Mm -hmm. always happy to do the legal. But the specific on the industry, mm -hmm. they don't want to do that anymore. Who's going to do it? Or one thing okay, so the actual industry due diligence, they don't want to touch anymore. Well, that's where the, that's where the fraud and shit takes place. They just want to do the financial, the banks, and make sure all the money. But well, if they keep bringing you money in deals, I mean, I'd live with it. But when you're doing a $100 million deal, I mean, you want to be able to hang somebody out to dry that makes a mistake, and you don't want all the responsibility on your own board. I mean... Um, but that doesn't surprise me. But now all they have to do is say money laundering uh, uh, and uh, they'll freeze the money wherever it is. And so that, that's one extra thing that is in the last 15 or so years that didn't used to exist. Okay, YouTube, thank you.